to make a start. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the session on the Sarfati Sanitation Challenge. My name is Poon Mataj of World Waternet, and I will be your host today. Together with Leandra Roller of aqua for all we will moderate this session. Today, the 10 semi-finalists of the Sarfati Sanitation Challenge showcase their sanitation solutions, after which the jury members will reflect on their potential. Let me take you through the agenda quickly. Um, there will be a formal welcome from Josine Sluis and Frodo van Oostveen. After that, following re uh, opening remarks by Joke Baak, followed by 10 short pitches of the 10 semi-finalists. The pitches will be followed by three different panel discussions and we will close off with a wrap up and closing. Some last remarks before starting. Um, this session will take one hour and is being recorded. The recordings will become available on the World Water Week website by next week. The slides will be uploaded in Pathable, just like, um, no, not a list of contact details, that uh, if you want to contact the semi-finalist, uh, please do that through the uh, email address that will be provided at the end of the session. Please use the chat for your questions and remarks to the jury. We will keep an eye on them and reflect on it during the panel discussions. And then again, possible questions to the semi-finalists should be kept for later in a one-on-one -on -one discussion between yourself and the semi-finalists. We will start with a formal welcome of this session by Josine Sluis, CEO of aqua for all and Frodo Oostveen, CEO of World Waternet. Thank you so much, Poon, for the introduction. I um, am very, very uh, proud to present to you the Sarfati Sanitation Challenge, also on behalf of Frodo van Oostveen. He is the CEO of World Waternet. I'm the managing director of Aqua for All. Uh, Frodo have, has a few uh, technical issues with logging in, so as soon as he manages to step in, he'll also welcome you. But first of all, uh, a very warm welcome to all the people that listen in from all over the world. And of course, the digital setting of this Stockholm International Water Week allows many more interested people to join us without a huge carbon footprint. But of course, we also miss the live interaction with all of you. Um, we're going to make something very special of this digital event. After four Sarfati Sanitation Lifetime Achievement Award for individuals and organizations, and the Sarfati Sanitation Award for Young Promising Entrepreneur, together we decided that it was time for a change and to change the award setting into a Sarfati Sanitation Challenge because we are much behind in achieving the goals to access sanitation services. And therefore, we decided to, to start challenging and, insp and inspiring people that are able to bridge this gap. We're also very pleased to put the spotlight on our partner Accenture. They have guided many of those innovations and acceleration trajectories before, and therefore, we asked them to team up with us. After the kickoff in May, Accenture helped us scouting to find solutions, especially and also uh, beyond our own networks, they also helped us in selecting the most promising solution and provided those entrepreneurs um, with uh, the much relevant training. We also have five very special experts on board that were willing to be part of the jury. We don't only benefit from their very critical views to select the best and most scalable solution, but they've also offered to share their expertise with our semi-finalists. Thank you so much, jury members. And indeed, it is all about collaboration, teamwork, and being part of a strong and healthy entrepreneurial sanitation community. We're very, very proud that our journey continues 
and our next milestone will be during the Amsterdam International Water Week in November. During this Water Week, we will announce the winner of this Sarfati Sanitation Challenge. Um, of course, Kuhn later on in the session will, will explain to you how to join us during those few upcoming months and uh, also be part of the, the finalist presentation. Well, anyway, stay tuned and uh, uh, a very good luck to the semi finalist uh, who and let us um, enjoy today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Yossi. Uh, is Frodo online and is he going to join or should I? No, sir. Hi, guys. Frodo, it's very good to hear you. Please yeah, take no, it. Likewise. No, I, I only can echo what Yosin was already mentioning. I'm very happy to do this together with Agrifol, happy to do this with Accenture, happy to do this with Ministry of Foreign Affairs and our uh, members of the jury. So I will give it back to you, Kuhn, but great to see you all. I'm proud that we're hosting this session together and uh, looking forward to uh, the pitches of the semi-finalists. Back to you, Kuhn. Thanks. Thank you, Frodo, and I'm happy to you. You made it digitally. I know it, it's always a, a challenge to get the uh, infrastructure up and running. It's team building. The opening team building. remarks. Yes, the opening remarks will be brought to us by Joko Back, working at the Director General for International Cooperation at the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Please, Joko, take the floor. Um, do you hear me? Okay. Um, providing access to sustainable, safe and affordable sanitation and hygiene is a spearhead in Dutch development cooperation. Together with access to safe and affordable drinking water, it is a first and essential step towards social and economic development and poverty reduction. COVID-19 has made us once again aware of the importance for, for, of hygiene for health. The challenge, that, the challenge that has been taken on here is named after the Dutch physician, Dr. Samuel Safati. In the 19th century, Dr. Safati noticed the miserable circumstances of the poor inhabitants of Amsterdam. No running water, no sewerage and dirt everywhere. Outbreaks of cholera and typhus often occurred. Being aware of the importance of sanitation and hygiene for health, he started his own manure and waste company. Quite revolutionary for the time, I think. To a large extent, dirt and sludge disappeared from the streets and canals. And, his, and so he contributed to healthy living conditions and poverty reduction. To me, this shows the importance of innovation and private entrepreneurship. Nowadays, worldwide 4.2 billion people still live under the poor conditions that Dr. Samuel Safati encountered in the 19th century. We, found that we find that unacceptable. The Netherlands are a trusted supporter of, of, the, of the 2030 agenda, but we will never achieve its goals if we do not achieve SDG 6. Therefore, the Netherlands have pledged to provide 50 million people with access to safe sanitation and 30 million people to safe drinking water by 2030. However, to achieve the SDG 6 targets, we need a fourfold increase of the current progress rate. The amount needed greatly exceeds the availability of donor funds. Many countries do not have the resources to meet their national targets. So we think the involvement of the private sector and commercially viable and innovative sanitation solutions can contribute considerably to achieve SDG 6.2 and access to safe, and sa to safe sanitation for all forever. The Dutch wash strategy aims to create strong and transformational sanitation sectors with better skills with local in which local governments, utilities and the private sector can play their roles to contribute to our common goals. Reason why we support Aqua for All's work on innovative, sustainable and inclusive water and sanitation economies worldwide. 
enabling private sanitation providers to accelerate access to sanitation. We greatly appreciate the efforts of this year's participants. You will follow in the footsteps of Dr. Safati, who contributed considerably to the welfare and well-being of the citizens of Amsterdam by being innovative and entrepreneurial. I hope your efforts will be just as, as successful and the challenge allows you to scale up. I'm very much looking forward to your presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joke, for your uh, interesting background um, story and stimulating words. Thank you. Um, then uh, we come to the core of this uh, session, uh, which, is, which is the presentation of the 10 semi-finalists. Um, they will be pitching their organizations and their work in uh, a 10 one-minute pitches. We have grouped them uh, in three groups, uh, container-based solutions, treatment and reuse, community integrated models. After um, the three pitches in uh, the first one, we will have a, uh, in the first group, we will have a panel discussion uh, among the jury members facilitated by uh, Leandra Roller, after which we will continue with the second group. Before we start that, there is one thing left for me to do, uh, which is to present the jury members to you. First of all, there is Sasha Kramer, co-founder and CEO of Soil. Then Sander Mager, executive board member of the Regional Public Water Authority of Amstel Gooienvecht in Amsterdam. Mirjor Rahman, CEO of Bangladesh Angels. Art van den Beugel, founder and CEO of Safisana. And last but not least, Cheryl Hicks, senior advisor to the UN Special Initiative on CEO Water Mandate. I would like to give the floor to the first three pitches to be shown. Poor sanitation cost the world more than $220 billion in 2015. Not to mention sanitation and synthetic fertilizer production are responsible for more than 9% of greenhouse gases emission. Akias is a portable waste water treatment plant in a bag. A bag that fit Poor sanitation cost the world more than $220 billion in 2015. Not to mention, sanitation and synthetic fertilizer production are responsible for more than 9% of greenhouse gases emission. Akias is a portable waste water treatment plant in a bag. A bag that fits all different types of container-based sanitation systems. It is an integrated system that is composed of one, a bag that is compostable, a pan that is made for the washer population, and lastly, a pathogen killing powder. We invite everyone from different sectors, different expertise to drop us a line on the email shown below. Did you know that 4.2 billion people lack access to safe toilets? That's because they live in places with no sewage plumbing, so they can't flush. So instead of flushing waste, Change Water Labs has invented a way to shrink it. The iThrone is a no-flush toilet that evaporates human waste. 95% of human waste is just water. Get rid of that water and you've got a lot less waste to deal with. The iThrone collects waste in bags made of a novel breathable membrane that we call shrink wrap for crap. Inspired by nature's process of evapotranspiration, this bag soaks up and quickly evaporates the water content of waste. Nothing but pure water vapor is discharged from the iThrone. So it requires no plumbing, uses no water, 
and cleans up communities. Because it's so simple, the iThrone is five times cheaper than comparable toilets. And by shrinking waste on site, it cuts waste collection costs in half. So the iThrone is truly the green toilet, saving money and the environment, and making safe sanitation available to everyone, everywhere. To tackle the sanitation crisis and its disastrous consequences, Mosan provides a complete and climate-positive container-based sanitation solution, including our mobile dry toilet, a modular collection and transport service, and our own transformation center. We are making sanitation accessible and attractive in communities where conventional systems fail. We believe we need systemic and regenerative solutions. Therefore, we've designed a process and machine to transform human feces via pyrolysis into biochar, a charcoal that we further enrich to produce fertilizers for agriculture, improving soil health, providing nutrients and storing CO2 in the soil to tackle climate change. Most important for us is awareness creation and education to ensure long-term change. Like here at Lake Atitlan in Guatemala, where we co-create with the local population. The world can't wait for sewers. Through replication, we will make sure the Mosan system is available to many people. My name is Mona, director and founder of Mosan. Great. Um, I think this was a, was a nice uh, introduction to our first topic that we'd like to talk about today, which is uh, container-based sanitation. So I guess everybody in the sector is aware that uh, container-based sanitation is a trend that's gaining more and more popularity. And uh, I'm Leandra Roller, working for Aqua for All. I have a background in sanitation and water resources management. And I'd like to talk uh, with the panelists a bit more about this trend, why it's gaining popularity, and yeah, the benefits it can offer. And uh, I'd like to start with you, Sasha. Um, I know it's very early where you are right now. I'm glad you could join and um, hope you uh, would be uh, willing to share a bit of your experience. You're working with the soil, also on container-based sanitation. As a former recipient of the Sarfati Award, um, maybe you would uh, mind sharing a bit of your yeah, ideas on what are the benefits that uh, container-based sanitation can bring, maybe with regards to the climate and the environment. Looking forward. Oh, I'm happy to. Oh, <clears throat> those are the first words I've said this morning. So good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And it was really exciting to see these three innovations in container-based sanitation. It's, it's amazing to, to hear that it has become this emerging trend. It makes me feel rather old, actually. Um, but I think that some of the things that came to mind in watching this video um, are First of all, the climate benefits, which was one of the first things mentioned. And I know that this has also become very important in the sector, thinking about the linkages between sanitation and climate. And one of the exciting things about container-based sanitation is that it's not only very resilient to climate change and that there is, there's, it's a very low infrastructure requirement, but it also is climate positive and that because water is not used, it's an aerobic process. And therefore it helps to mitigate some of the emissions that come from wastewater. And then I, I think that for me, what I've seen in the sector, one of the most exciting things about container-based sanitation is the fact that it can be rapidly deployed. So I think that we often wait for large infrastructure projects to reach those most in need. And because this crisis is so serious, we need rapidly deployable solutions right now. And container-based san sanitation is one of those. And then just finally, I would say what I found exciting about these three presentations is that I think they address some of the challenges in container-based sanitation. Um, one of those certainly being the logistics of collection and treatment. And so I'm, I'm very curious to learn more about um, these solutions that can either eliminate high transport requirements or do some of the treatment on site. And then I think the final challenge I'll bring up is that, that we know we 
we live in a world that is changing. However, there is still this idea of the water flush toilet being the gold standard. And I think that some of the work container-based sanitation providers are doing is to shift that aspiration. And so it was exciting to see that, that beautiful most fan toilet as well. Thank you very much. Thanks. And I think that's a, that's a great hand over to uh, the next person I'd like to talk to, which is uh, Sander. Um, Sander works for uh, the Water Authority of uh, Greater Amsterdam, and he's in charge there, amongst other things, um, of water quality and circular economy. Um, now, the, the sanitation systems you're handling there are far more based on uh, yeah, water, um, water as a transport medium. Maybe you would like to reflect a bit on where you see the benefits in container-based sanitation with regards to, yeah, saving water and how that also reflects on climate and uh, the environment and the society as a whole. Yeah, happy to do that, uh, Leandra, and uh, uh, good morning, everybody, or uh, in whatever time zone uh, you are. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I'm very much inspired by uh, these presentations uh, uh, of this year's uh, participants. Um, happy to say a few things uh, about uh, the water saving benefits of containing based solutions. Uh, you know that uh, Joko talked about the, the, the SDGs and uh, most of you know that there's a strong interdependency between the SDG water target uh, 6.1 um, and the SDG sanitation uh, target 6.2. Uh, Western Europe and the Netherlands in particular have indeed a very long history of, of water-based centralized sanitation infrastructure with uh, uh, long and strong sewing systems and waste treatment facilities. Uh, but you see that in many regions worldwide, it, it is impractical and, and sometimes even impossible to expect water availability and infrastructure to support the implementation of sanitation in addition to providing basic sanitation access. Uh, so in those regions, I think uh, container-based solutions are really part of the solution. But also in Western Europe, we are rethinking our sanitation systems. Um, and, and the reason for that has also to do with water availability, uh, but also with circular economy. Um, we are really looking for systems that, that close uh, on a local scale often uh, water and nutrient uh, cycles. Um, and we are even piloting some of those systems uh, in, uh, in Amsterdam. And that is why even I, from that regional water um, authority perspective uh, in the Netherlands, uh, uh, am interested in container-based solutions. So I'm, I'm very eager to learn more from this year's participants about how their solutions uh, are saving uh, water, um, but also about uh, how they make sure that the system does not produce waste, but facilitates the reuse of nutrients. And I very much realize that the, uh, even though the, uh, the solution is container-based, that the container itself is not just the solution because sustainability comes from that whole value chain. And especially in, in, in closing uh, nutrient and water cycles, uh, other stakeholders are critically important. So I would also like to know more about the partnerships uh, that our participants have forced to create a sustainable value chain. Thank you. That's uh, great to hear the, the type of interest you also have in uh, these solutions. And I'm sure um, this is a nice jury to, to also work on and maybe uh, yeah, help those enterprises work a bit more on the challenges that you see. Um, maybe, I don't know, is Art is there? Yes. Hi, Art. Um, Art is a CEO, CEO of uh, Safisana, working also on the value chain. Um, as uh, Sandra has mentioned, so the container is only one part of the solution, but it's an important part. Um, what are the challenges that you see? I mean, you're not working on container-based sanitation, but is that something that you consider also for your solutions? And how do you think it fits into solving the problem of logistics? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, Sander touched upon it already. Uh, so that's a good introduction. Yeah, so we are purely looking at the, the treatment side of it. And um, yeah, I mean, as a treater, we are dependent on the sources. Uh, so the, the close collaboration with the supplier is, is very critical. And in all the solutions that I've seen here, I think that is potentially there. But I think that's something to, uh, to clearly keep in mind. Now, how do you make sure that there indeed is a, um, uh, yeah, a close connection in terms of uh, frequent supplies in, and, and also keeping in mind the transport cost that uh, Sasha also talked about, that can be a big challenge. 
So I think that's uh, yeah, it definitely is is a big issue, and uh, and also for me interesting to hear later from the from the players here how they see that hey, are they the supplier of the of the technology uh, on the service side, and if they talk about treatment, are they really want to go into that or is it part of their whole business case, etc. I think that's also something to that we have seen initially. We were looking at services as well at toilet services, but then we decided to more focus on treatment itself. So do you want to split that in two or not? I mean, it can go both ways, by the way, yeah? but it's just interesting to hear more about it. But uh, it has to work, especially if you want to scale up your uh, your ideas and we have to, if, if we want to make a big impact. Um, yeah, perhaps another small note that I also wanted to say is about uh, how, how it would fit in the environment. And again, I'm not uh, working specifically in a container-based uh, world, but... I think working with dry toilets, I think the others can, can explain that better perhaps, but it's, it can be challenging. It's something that we've uh, encountered as well. And so how does the government look at it? How does the community look at it? So, um, and yeah, so there's a lot of work to be done still, but indeed it's a very interesting uh, solution way forward. Also for us as a treater. Yeah, yeah. now that's uh, some, some nice input I'm hearing here. Um, but yeah, let's have a look at uh, that that other next step in the in the value chain, which is treatment. And I think over to the next three pitches. Dear audience, my name is Rob van Opdorp. I'm a design engineer and founder of Blue Elephant BV. When it comes to getting rid of domestic waste. There are loads of sanitation solutions. None of these, however, are more efficient than this one. In an ideal world, this flushed away water is treated to be used over and over again. This ultimate way of recycling we call infinite water. The Blue Elephant was compiled to secure this infinite water flow. A Blue Elephant allows for solar powered, small footprint, and low cost decentralized treatment and reuse for irrigation or artificial recharge of groundwater. Above all, it ensures instant human and environmental health at community level. In the Blue Elephant, we combined existing and proven technologies in an extremely compact device. The effluent can even be turned into drinking water. Can we make it more infinite when water matters? Blue Elephant, thank you for your attention. Hello everyone, we are from CDD Society. About half a million kids die every year in developing countries due to diarrhea. The centralized STP systems, which saved millions of lives in developed countries, are not feasible in Global South due to their high setup cost, huge energy and water requirement, and also due to complex OM systems. DWATS is a decentralized system which requires no electricity, no chemicals or skill-based labor. It mimics nature-based system to treat wastewater and fecal sludge. The treated water and sludge can be used for agriculture by the local communities too. We want to mainstream DWATS to improve access to safe sanitation in developing countries, to ensure safe treatment of wastewater and fecal sludge, to also save our precious surface water and groundwater from contamination. My name is Jordan Kwame Aguda, CEO and founder of Washkin Limited. According to UNICEF, only 15% of Ghanaians in 2017 had access to improved sanitation. Price and adequacy are important factors which limit access to good toilets among disadvantaged people. In response to this, Washkin makes supplies and installs environmentally safe, accessible and affordable biodigester toilets for low-income and underserved urban households and institutions. Washkin's newly introduced smart toilets help to remove cost barrier to sanitation access in order to scale from current 600 toilets to 40,000 toilets by 2030 using social franchise model. We invite you to support us so together we can build a safer, healthier and sustainable future together. 
Nice. Um, some more input. So I think the the last uh, pitches that we've seen, the screen always disappears. Here you are again. Um, are looking more into into yeah water based uh, sanitation systems. So compared to uh, container based sanitation that we've seen before, usually a bit more costly in the treatment processes. Um, let's talk a bit about the challenges that those enterprises may face. And I'd uh, like to start again with you, Art. Um, so we often see in the sanitation sector that there is this expectation that sanitation businesses need to get some ingredients right and then that business model will work out and there is sufficient reuse products to be sold and biogas to be sold. Is this somewhat of an unrealistic expectation and what are your experiences there and uh, do you have some recommendations for those enterprises on how they could yeah, raise awareness on the topic and maybe get more public funding also. Yeah, yeah, so that's indeed a point. And um, wh when I started the Savasana business, I was very convinced that it can be a very commercial business. And that, that, uh, and that means that, for me at least, that means that you can uh, earn back your uh, initial investment. And yeah, you can make a profit and not a big profit, but you can make a profit. And I think over time, I've, I've learned about the, the water sector and uh, the wastewater sector. And um, and that so the, the expectation that I have is still alive with many even of the public sector funders, and that that they think indeed um, that uh, to run a business is not just to run your operational cost but also to have an earn back and even to refund your capital cost, uh, your interest or whatever is needed to get your in, uh, investment done. And um, I think that that is a reality that we cannot accept. I think we have to be aware and we also have to communicate how it works. We should not just say we need the public sector to fund or to co-fund the process, but uh, we need to be very clear as a private business. And I think most of the businesses that I've seen, they have a similar challenge. Uh, I think the first objective for us, for example, is to cover your operational costs. Uh, if you have a, your daily cost of running your, uh, your machines and et cetera, you have to be able as a recycling business to cover that, definitely, including your maintenance cost. Because if that cannot be covered, then you constantly have to ask for subsidies or whatever, and that won't work. So, uh, but then again, but then on the initial investments, that is a different topic, I think. Yeah? So can you, I mean, we as a business cannot cover the initial investments or at least not completely. So you will need to indeed look at uh, public resources. And um, yeah, so, and, and they are, they exist, but, um, so, but I think it starts with a clear communication. So also they understand how it works because it's a new kind of model. It's a new kind of financing mechanism. That is it's it, the blended finance with, with private and, and, and public money is not that simple. And so I think it's about being, I mean, we as an entrepreneur have a responsibility to make sure we run our business the way I just described. Uh, and at the same time, we have to explain how it works to, to the funders and how they can support and in what form that, that could work. And um, yeah, and I think it's relatively a new, a new sector. Um, I'm also looking at the Toilet Board Coalition at the time they started the whole discussion. And this was one of the key topics. So you need a bigger platform to, to communicate about it and to, um, yeah, to, to try and explain together how, how it should work. Yeah. yeah, and I think for me, I mean, looking at the pitches that we've just seen, uh, it's not completely clear yet how that would work for them. But I think that could be something we can look at and we can even, uh, or I can give my, my review, my ideas on that. Uh, and how do you want to scale that, of course, and how, what happens to your CAPEX and operational costs? Can you have economies of scale? Those kind of things. I think these are key issues for the success of these models. Yeah, very, very interesting topics. I think this also links very well with the theme of our Sarfati session, which is the yeah, sanitation and health. Uh, from a from a community perspective, but as well also with the overall water work theme of uh, resilience, um, resilience also for the society. And I think, yeah, some, some interesting conversations to be had. Um, I'd like to uh, go on to uh, Nirjur from uh, the Bangladesh uh, Angel um, Investor Network. Um, Nirjur has also worked with the WhatsApp on setting up um, the sweep model in, in Bangladesh and is uh, familiar with the Bangladesh sanitation sector. Um, Nijer, first of all, feel free, of course, to reflect on what Art has said. Um, otherwise, from your experience in the Bangladesh market, what do you see as the niches for those enterprises, uh, the ones of the pitches right now? And or let's say, where do you see the biggest application potential there? 
For sure. And I think, um, you know, maybe reflecting on what Art said, but also what happened in the last panel, you know, we did try to implement container based systems in Bangladesh. And, you know, what we learned, in addition to the challenges described, is at least from a Bangladeshi perspective, and I would imagine this is true in South Asia, you know, there is less preference for pay as you go and more of a preference for permanent access, whether it's through direct access or indirect access, community based ownership. Uh, and so the general kind of trend I've seen with low income families is, you know, you'll start out with a shared toilet. Uh, at the neighborhood level, then you would bring it into your house or compound outdoor pit latrine. And then as you kind of build your dwelling, you know, a, a, a go towards a brick and concrete structure, or maybe you move into an apartment building, then you get a septic tank. And the problem with septic tanks is, you know, there has to be a technology and a business answer to that septic tanks, because the way I've seen them build, they're essentially just underground concrete boxes, right? They're actually, they don't have chambers. Sometimes they're just really designed to extrude as much waste into the natural drainage or or you know um, the municipal drainage, especially during times of high rains, right? And so that's you know at the same time you know there's a ton of investment happening in Bangladesh and I'd imagine throughout the region uh, from a public sector standpoint when it comes to sewer networks, sewer treatment plants. But it's also true that you can only so, you know reach so many dwellings. And so you know there are and there are some opportunities. You know we found that on the collection side, you know consumers are willing to pay for high, safe, hygienic collection, timely collection. And so you know we found a model there. The second is, I think, at the unit level, once again, if we can find the right technologies, whether maybe it's through DWATs or, you know, bio digesters, digesters et cetera, um, at the building level, at the compound level, and maybe even at the, you know, uh, at the sort of neighborhood level. Uh, and, you know, the, I guess the opportunities from a private sector perspective is, you know, let's say you're building a factory, you know, you're gonna have thousands of people, let's say you're building a high rise building, you're gonna have thousands of people or hundreds of people in a dwelling. Septic tanks aren't cheap, you know, they end up being pretty expensive when it's concrete. And then so if there's something that could kind of, you know, potentially be competitive against that. Uh, at the same time, I think a lot of the new construction happening in markets like Bangladesh is actually private public sector driven, right? So it's public private partnerships, it's on public land. Um, and so if it could be mandated to that model as well, I think that could also be interesting. Uh, linking into that again, um, you say public, public, private, uh, also financing. What is what? What do you see as the strongest argument to get yeah, also public funding into financing into it? Is it is it the health aspect, is it resilience, or is it just convenience for everybody? Yeah, I think um, at least from a public finance standpoint, uh, you know, I mean, it kind of happens through different mechanisms, right? So it could be kind of guarantees to get financing from you know, local sources of debt and potentially international sources as well. Um, and obviously the, the value of the land and, and the lease right, that you might have over a multi-decade period is also has value. I've yet to see elements where the public sector goes directly into finance you know, construction as well as you know, added value construction, so I'd say for you know, uh, things like treatment systems. But I think that's where the, value, you know, the benefit of the public sector can come in is if they mandate this as part of the design process, right? Um, especially for new construction, I think that's important. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, and let's go to the, to the last set of uh, pitches. Namaste, my name is Prakash Amate and I am the Nepal country representative to Aerosol. We provide sanitation solutions in urban areas. We build and manage public toilets in a partnership with the municipalities. Our pay for use public toilets cater to women, disabled and include a waste to value system with water recycling. It creates jobs for a minority Dalit women from sanitation workers cooperative in a circular economy business model. They get well-paid, dignified jobs. Our model converts human waste into renewable energy and biofertilizer entering the drain and dramatically lowering health risks. 90% of the revenue comes from the user fee and the sales of a net profit of 1200 US dollar per month per toilet. We were recognized at the UN Science, Technology and Innovation Forum in 2020. At present, we operate six public toilets and Kathmandu Metropolitan City has budgeted for 32 more Aerosan model toilets. We have a great opportunity availed if Aerosan can match that local government commitment with the investments for the first three years after which public finance takes over. Thank you. Hello, we are the Sandy Path team, a world-class team of WASH experts with backgrounds in public health and development based in the United States and Ghana. Municipalities lack public health evidence to make effective sanitation investments. 
Over the past 10 years, our team has developed novel methodologies founded in public health principles to assess sanitation challenges. Our services support evidence-based decision-making about investments and policies. SaniPath has impacted over 2 million people to date in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. We are pivoting from a grant-funded model to a revenue-generating model to ensure sustainability. By exploring new market segments, we will be able to cross-subsidize services in our core market in low- and middle-income countries. In the wake of this global pandemic, it is more crucial than ever for public health data to inform policy and planning. SaniPath can do that. My name is Manuel Gungulu, and I'm the founder of Susamati. So in Mozambique, the sanitation coverage is only 24%, which means that there is 22 million people lacking on proper sanitation facilities. One of the reasons for that is because in a poor country like Mozambique, having a toilet is very expensive for low-income families. And that's the reason why we brought to the market this solution, which is called Pia Fantastica, which is a toilet that besides being colorful and having a modern design, it also uses only one cup of water to flush it. Besides this solution, we're also researching the use of black soldier fly larvae, which is a special maggot that inoculated in the pit, it can eat the human feces and reduce the need of emptying their normal toilet with need. I'm here to ask for your support so that we can increase our production and distribution capacity and we can reach to more people in Mozambique and why not in Africa. Thank you. Two million people globally still lack access to basic sanitation, facing daily harassment and being deprived of their right to health. While traditional toilet construction is time, cost and labor intensive, prefabricated solutions are complex and incur last mile distribution issues. Lota Plus devised a household toilet reforming the interrelated architecture, behavior change and cleanliness aspect. Produced from upcycling waste, our holistic, low-cost flat pack toilet is fast and easy to install. Our extensive on-ground producer and sales network deploys it at scale to disconnected users while acting as an aggregator for other allied products. With the Lota Plus toilet, a household saves itself from diseases and harassment along with remitting carbon emissions, upcycling landfill and human waste while recycling wastewater. Committed to creating a sustainable world with equal sanitation and led by Jack Sim from World Toilet Organization, we started this partner journey by executing pilots at very content, creating a world which is hygienic, healthy and happy. Come join the Lota Plus revolution. Great. Um, now we've seen a, a nice range of uh, sanitation solutions here, ranging from community sanitation to private to talking about the health impact on a societal level. Um, let's start with the community sanitation centers, and uh, I'd like to talk to Cheryl here. Um, you surely all know Cheryl from uh, the former, formerly uh, with the Toilet Board Coalition, now working with the AC Infra Partners, correct me if I pronounce it wrongly. Um, so you have worked with the TBC on a lot of community sanitation centers and I think also private uh, sanitation access. Maybe um, would you like to reflect a bit on what experiences do you have with innovations and what are driving community private toilet businesses um, yeah, to become sustainable and uh, successful? Sure, sure. Thank you, um, and thank you to to all of the uh, the businesses that have uh, presented here. Um, really fantastic to see how the innovations are evolving. So, so congratulations and and thank you. Um, when we started to uh, look at businesses in the sanitation sector via the Toilet Board Coalition, um, from a a large business perspective, looking for partnerships and and scale, the most important thing was value creation. And um, sanitation, you know, the, the the focus on sanitation, you know, rightly over the, the, the past decade and access to sanitation has been on um, providing access to toilets um, and treatment. But the um, the justification for the costs of that through value creation, you know, was less uh, in focus. And, and I think over the past, um, you know, five, uh, five or six years, that's really been the trend that has started to accelerate, which we're really happy to see and I think is evidenced by the companies that have presented today. And so, you know, I would say to, um, 
to those uh, um, uh, challenge finalists that are, are here today is that you know what investors really want to see and and what partners really want to see is that value creation and in particular the the co benefits um, of that value creation um, and so so less uh, just numbers of of access to toilets and and treatment which is important to show progress, but in terms of the, uh, the, the value generation of the business uh, and, uh, and the co-benefits uh, related to climate change and, and water stewardship um, are equally important. So, so just uh, one of the learnings that we found over the years. Um, and, and just to maybe highlight a couple of uh, those, those innovations, uh, Leandra, that, that you asked for. Um, uh, so um, with my hat of the, the CEO water mandate, which is the UN Global Compact's water initiative, um, have created a, a new uh, CEO-led initiative called the Water Resilience Coalition. And this coalition is committed to, um, to ensuring WASH resilience uh, in value chains of the largest uh, companies, the largest water users um, to 2030. And so um, this is opening up a new set of demands you know, for, uh, for businesses in those value chains value chains in the basins uh, where these companies are operating. So I wanted to draw your attention to that because it's a fantastic opportunity, you know, for partnerships with large businesses that can help to enable scale. And there's new commitments to this um, uh, as of 2020. Um, the second thing is is uh, is the um, ACE Infra Partners, Leandra, um, that I'm a co-founder of, and, and this is a new investment facility. And ACE stands for Advancing the Sanitation Economy, um, and we're investing in uh, sanitation economy business infrastructure um, by providing a new financing uh, stream, uh, an alternative to debt and equity, where uh, we are buying the assets of sanitation businesses um, in order to provide them financing um, for expansion. Um, and uh, we're piloting uh, this model with um, uh, with our first capital raised uh, in 2021 and looking to to scale up from 2022. So we're, our first in investments are in India in, in 2021, um, but we really uh, hope that this could be a model uh, to enable that needed financing that's been mentioned a few times uh, in this session to uh, sanitation businesses that are, are ready to grow. Uh, and as Sasha said, you know, we really need um, that, uh, that growth now um, with these new models that can do it faster, uh, more cost-effectively um, and have uh, more benefits in terms of co-benefits uh, via climate and, and water stewardship. Thank you. Great, thanks. Thanks a lot for, uh, for these insights. Um, Nirjur, may I also pick your brain on that? Um, maybe a bit on your views or your experiences uh, with the ownership, um, as, as Cheryl was saying, uh, trying to finance those uh, the sanitation initiatives. Um, what's, your, what's your experience? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's, it's interesting, right? So Bangladesh is the birthplace of community-led total sanitation. And, and one element of that is the, the community-based organization model uh, that I've seen you know, work very well in peri-urban areas or maybe less dense uh, low-income areas, whereby you would have uh, a few families kind of come together, often at the instigation of NGOs that work in that particular area. You know, they would create a cooperative that's, kind of rec that's recognized by the municipality and in particular the low-income de department of that municipality, because ultimately the land is under the control of the municipality, right? That's who owns it. But you know, the municipality gives access to that cooperative to build you know, shared infrastructure, such as a toilet block, such as a washing space, such as a tube well. And you know, these infrastructure itself, you know, the you know, overlying infrastructure would be under the ownership of the cooperative. They would have their own kind of joint bank account. They would pull their you know, funds together and that would be the basis for operational maintenance expenses. I've even seen it where you know, they're, they're quite democratic. They have you know, general secretaries, they have you know, rotating presidents and secretaries right, on a yearly basis. They even have schedules for cleaning where you know, family, different families will take it, you know, week by week basis. So that's worked out well, at least in the first, you know, decade or so of introducing that model. Um, obviously, in more transient communities, uh, in more densely populated areas, I think landlords are a really big factor. That's what I've seen when it comes to improving sanitation, because the expectation that these urban migrants would have is, you know, obviously I'm, I'm paying for a room, I'm paying a monthly expense, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 dollars per month. And obviously you're pulling that together, but you have to provide me certain things, right? You got to provide me with a toilet block, you have to provide me with a shared cooking space, you have to provide electricity, you have to provide um, you know, gas, et cetera. And so that's where the, the landlords end up kind of, you know, oftentimes maybe even borrowing funds from microfinance uh, sources or informally to be able to kind of improve the infrastructure. So those are kind of the two elements I've seen when it comes to ownership. 
Uh, and then, yeah, it's quite interesting what Cheryl was talking about with ACE. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity um, in that as well, particularly when it comes to, say, public latrines. You know, those are our very big business and, you know, minis urban municipalities of Bangladesh where, you know, oftentimes the municipality would kind of build these uh, public toilets as part of bazaars, uh, you know, convening areas like bazaars, bus stops, et cetera. They would even have a yearly auction where different operators would kind of bid for different blocks. They would pay an upfront charge and then they would recoup that over the course of the year, right? And, and also make money on peripherals and potentially advertising as well. So those are some interesting business models I've seen there as well. Great. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of potentials everywhere and uh, financing opportunities. And one, one last question I'd have to, to all of you is uh, we, we had that one outlier in uh, this, uh, this last uh, pitch deck, which was a sunny path that are uh, working on yeah, showcasing the, the impact of sanitation on community health. Um, now they're they're yeah not classically a sanitation enterprise, but they fit extremely well with the, our theme of community uh, sanitation and and health. Um, would one of you feel like reflecting on potential for their business models and maybe giving them some some advice of uh, how to how to get sustainable? No. Yeah, it seems like they have a lot of contracts, right? Um, they built a really good kind of franchise advising organizations in different markets. And so I think from that perspective, maybe it's less a startup business, more of an SME type, you know, consulting practice, but maybe there's opportunities to kind of look at their pipeline, advise them on how they can grow it and, and you know, go from, yeah, and potentially finance elements of that. Okay, okay. Um, I think you're all going to have an interesting discussion with those panelists. <clears throat> and I think uh, I'll, I'll just wrap it up from here, unless uh, you have any more questions uh, to our finalists at this moment. Yes, Asha? Yeah, no, I'd, I'd just like to say a quick word. I think it, it, it brings together a lot of what different people have been saying here. It was great to hear Cheryl speak about the importance of, of value creation uh, within the sanitation sector. And I just wanna give a, a word of caution when we speak about sanitation businesses, just to remind us all that sanitation is still, does still provide a public benefit. And in many contexts, although we can generate incredible value and reuse products, that does not necessarily mean that you're going to be able to have a standalone commercial business without the input of the public sector. And I think one of the keys to really making sanitation commercially viable is finding ways to monetize those co-benefits that sanitation provides. So looking at things like reduced water usage, health benefits, climate benefits, and finding a way to create financing resources out of that is going to be one of the keys to actually making commercially viable sanitation businesses. So just a word of caution so everyone doesn't feel like getting into the sector, you need to immediately have a profitable business. I think we need to really put our heads together and be creative and work with other sectors. Thank you, Sasha. I would uh, like to take this as a great wrap up of the session. I think we've uh, yeah, heard a lot of potential of how financing can be worked, but also these words of caution on not expecting too much because after all it is a public service and to the benefit of the whole community. And uh, yeah, looking forward to see how the finalists are continuing and we'll hand it over to Kuhn back with this. Thank you, uh, Leandra. I would like to uh, thank the jury once again and the semi-finalists for their presence and input today, their commitment and endless energy to put into the developing uh, to the, the development of the sanitation sector. And I heard valuable suggestions and remarks that uh, could give a clear direction to the semi-finalists for their further uh, development. Later this week, the jury will continue to elaborate on the work of the 10 semi-finalists and choose five entrepreneurs to continue to the final. These five finalists will be announced next week on social media. So you should keep an eye on that. 
They continue the Sarfati sanitation challenge in the coming month and meet again in the final during the Amsterdam International Water Week in November this year. Like said before, the PowerPoint uh, will be published on Pathable that was shown today. And the recordings of this session will be available by next week on the World Water Week website. So the journey continues. We hope to see you again in Amsterdam during the Amsterdam International Water Week, where the jury will announce the ultimate winner of the Sarfati Sanitation Challenge of 2021. Thank you all for your participation today and have an excellent day. Bye bye. Thank you and bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.